to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We talk to successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never have to be without a book you can't put down. You'll find episode show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. But now, here's our show. Hello, I'm Jenny Wheeler, journalist and historical mystery writer, and today I'm chatting to Steve Hawkinsmith. Steve has written two cosy mystery series, and they couldn't be more different. They might not even be cosy mystery series either because they've definitely got a dark touch. In the first series, two cowboy brothers roam the wild west of the 1890s, all saddled up a Sherlock Holmes and a Dr Watson, solving murders as they ride the range. In the second, a reformed con artist inherits her mother's tarot card salon and finds lots of dirty secrets come with the bequest. But before we hear from Steve, just a reminder that the show notes for this episode are available at the website, thejoysofbingereading.com forward slash Steve H. That's where you'll find links to Steve's website, a free ebook, and information on how to subscribe to future episodes of this podcast if you decide you don't want to miss out. But now let's get talking with Steve. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a time when I didn't love Sherlock Holmes, which isn't to say uh, that I hated him. I just was always aware of him. I think, um, I hope that everybody in the in the modern world is always sort of a, just sort of coming up aware of Sherlock Holmes. So he was sort of in the background. I knew of him. Uh, you, you, you know, you would encounter him in, in pop culture. And he seemed fine. But it wasn't until I got, um, I would say probably in, to be about... Uh, 12 years old that I became aware of the fact that my dad was actually a very, very big Sherlock Holmes fan. I guess maybe it's it's not until you're about 12 years old that you pay any attention to your dad. Uh, at least I was that way. Um, uh, so, or at least, you know, really uh, pay attention to what your parents are into or what your parents think about anything other than like when it's time for you to come in and eat. So I became aware of the fact that like, oh, my dad has this book uh, on his uh, mantelpiece um, the complete Sherlock Holmes, although you couldn't read the spine uh, when it was on the uh, up on the shelf because um, he read it uh, from cover to cover every year, and it got so bad that he had to tape it together with duct tape to keep it from falling apart. So um, I realized, like, oh look, there's all these Sherlock Holmes uh, stories up here uh, on the shelf. My dad's really into these, and um, I think I had a book report or something due for class, and it was one of those book reports where you got to read whatever you wanted. And I pulled down my dad's big, about to fall apart, uh, complete Sherlock Holmes, and I read *The Hound of the Baskervilles*, which is a, I think, fortuitous. That's a great place to start. That's such a fun, fun story. Even the Holmes is sort of like off screen for a lot of it, but it's still got such wonderful atmosphere and you get to know him so well and it's got stuff that's really going to grab a 12-year-old uh, kid. So um, after that, I sort of felt like, oh, I, I actually know this Holmes guy a little better. And I started to read him a little bit. Um, and when I got a little bit older, a few years down the line, the uh, Jeremy Brett uh, Grenada uh, adaptations came on uh, PBS public television in uh, America and my dad was going to watch these and I watched them with him and they were so fabulous and so I kind of had felt like I already knew Sherlock Holmes but I really think that those Jeremy Brett uh, uh, shows really cemented uh, who Holmes was for me and I'd seen the, the Basil Rathbones too before then uh, and, I, and I liked them fine because uh, even as a kid I, I've always loved old movies so I, I liked those but I think it was the Jeremy Brett um, version that really, uh, really made me feel like I know who this guy is. I really like this guy. Uh, this guy is a buddy of mine. And it's been that way ever since. Oh, that's fantastic. So when you got the idea to do um, this, the setting a Sherlock Holmes obsessive in the Wild West, I think now, how, how did it come about? 
Well, it came about uh, uh, in one walk through the woods with my wife. So it was probably over the course of about an uh, hour, probably not even because I'm a very bad hiker. I get I get tired. So it was maybe, we'll say, <laughs> 55 minutes um, that um, I was out hiking up uh, Mount Tamil Pius uh, in Marin County, where we were living at the time in California. And, uh, you know, so beautiful neck of the woods um, and, uh, you know, not a lot of cars or buildings or airplanes or what have you around. So, you know, really freeing up your mind to sort of my mind always kind of drifts back to the past and, you know, what would people have thought 100 years ago or 400 years ago or what have you walking through this very area, you know, so you, you can kind of let go of certain things. But there was one thing that was on my mind as I was hiking, and that was that um, there is a mystery magazine uh, over here, uh, Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, uh, which is a short fiction magazine that obviously is devoted to the mystery genre. And I had started to sell them short stories and um, so I was kind of trying to think of uh, an idea for the next story I was going to try to write for them. And I had had some uh, success writing Christmas stories for them because they have a holiday theme issue every year. And I thought, well, a theme issue, that gives me more of an in. If I, it makes it a little easier to sell a piece, right? If I, if I give them a theme that they're looking for, that's going to better my odds. And it just so happens that they also do a Sherlock Holmes tribute issue every year. And so I started thinking about that. And so I'm walking through the woods, thinking about Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, thinking about trying to sell them a story, thinking about a Sherlock Holmes story, and being in the West, thinking about the past. And the thought that occurred to me um, that, that was really the one that sparked it all was thinking about people from the past and thinking about Sherlock Holmes and thinking about the fact that, you know, those Sherlock Holmes stories, even though they're so very much identified, uh, obviously, with Victorian, Edwardian London, that time period really overlaps with what we think of as the quote-unquote Wild West. It was you know, the, the, the late 19th century. And so this sort of classic period of American history that uh, a lot of people are in love with, including my dad and including me, the Wild West, and... This other period of time that people love so dearly, you know, Victorian London, they were contemporaneous. They were at the same time. Uh, and that that's kind of hit me pretty hard. Like, whoa, wait a second. So people in the Old West could have been reading about Sherlock Holmes. Wow. Well, if you are uh, in a Wild West kind of setting, um, and along comes this magazine, and uh, and there's a story about this guy, Sherlock Holmes, and these amazing things he's doing. What are you going to make of that? How are you going to react to that? How are you going to try to apply whatever strikes you from it to your own world? And then that led me to thinking about, okay, somebody, of course, you know, if I'm trying to write a mystery story, it's got to be somebody decides to try to be a detective like Sherlock Holmes. They get, they've got to try to use his methods. Okay, somebody in the West. Got it. Okay, so if someone in the Wild West is going to try to be like Sherlock Holmes, who's the most fun and interesting person we can make be a Sherlock Holmes fan? Well, man, it's it's got to be. It's got to be a cowboy. I mean, how can it be anybody else, really? Um, so then there we go. It's a cowboy. But, well, if it's a cowboy and they're going to try to be Sherlock Holmes... Um, you know, your, your Holmes figure, there's a very good reason that uh, Holmes has his Watson, um, that when Conan Doyle is writing a Sherlock Holmes story, it would be very, very hard to tell those stories if you're always in Holmes's head, if you're always seeing things from Holmes's perspective, because there's, there's no surprise. You're seeing him put all the pieces together as, you, as he goes along. It's a lot more fun if you take a step back and there's a Watson who's uh, observing Holmes. And always seeing Holmes say, like, aha, you know, we're on the right track. And your uh, narrator is like, chuh, what? Um, and is putting the pieces together along with the reader at that same speed. So yada, 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 all that just to say that it made sense that there should be both a Holmes kind of figure, who's a cowboy, but there also should be a Watson figure, someone who's observing that guy. Um, and, well, okay, I guess it should be another cowboy. Who else is it going to be? And what's, what's the reason for this one cowboy to be sticking close to this other cowboy? Uh, yeah, I'll make them brothers. And there we go. That's, that was uh, when I came down off the mountain. 
that part of the story was absolutely in place. Two cowboy brothers read about Sherlock Holmes. One decides he wants to be Holmes. One is like, cha, what? And off they go. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful story. And it's a wonderful... What is it that you like best about Otto and Gustav yourself? What characteristics do they have that have become, you know, enjoyable for you? Well, you know, I, I have one brother, an older brother, um, and he, he and I are um, very similar, but in some ways very different. Um, and so it, it, felt, it, was, it felt natural to write about two brothers uh, and to write about them from the younger brother's perspective. Um, but as I thought more about who, who Otto and Gustav are, uh, you know, one is very sort of garrulous, uh, talkative and outgoing. Um, uh, that's uh, Otto, who's the narrator, sort of the Watson figure. Um, he's, he's a bit of a goofball. And then you've got uh, Gustav, who's um, more taciturn and uh, uh, sort of more pessimistic and not so sociable. Um, and at first I was thinking, like, well, is this some sort of reflection of my, of, uh, my brother and me? And I realized eventually, no, it's not. It's actually more that they are reflecting different sides of myself. Um, because I've got my one side, which you're hearing, which can be very talkative. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to shut me up. Uh, and sometimes I can be a goofball. And that's my um, auto side. Um, but I do also have a much more introverted, uh, quiet uh, Gustav side that... Um, is is not so social and just likes um, sort of a more solitary uh, approach to things, um, and so I I can relate to both characters and I like both characters even though um, one can be annoying uh, and one can be crusty. Um, <laughs> I I I can be annoying and I can be crusty. So uh, you know the, that's both sides of myself coming out, and um, I find that uh, because of that I never get tired of them. Um, what I have also figured out, though, which is mysterious, and this part I still, I'm not quite sure why, maybe it's just because Otto is the narrator. I always know exactly what Otto is thinking, and I, it's, it's not hard for me to figure out how Otto will react to things. Gustav is, is tougher, and sometimes he will surprise me in that I have to think really, really hard about what's going on in his head. And that's not even just in terms of the mystery. I, I, I pretty much always know what he's thinking about in terms of the, the mystery he's trying to solve. But just in terms of how is he reacting things and why is he being crabby today, sometimes it, it takes a lot of effort to, to break through the barriers and get into his head. Um, but uh, but so I always get in there sooner or later. Sure, sure, sure. One of the things that's quite poignant about it under, underlying all the fun and games is that they both are underdogs and, the, and there is the hint of more than a hint of a tragic past and it's the same with Alanis, the hero of your other series, the White Magic Five and Dime series they've, they've all your char main characters that I've read um, have overcome very tough circumstances and learned to walk tall and I wonder if that also is, is an underlying theme that you find pleasure and excitement in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, if you look at um, sort of some of the roots of the Holmes and the Range series in particular, it does, it's, not, it's not just going back to Holmes, although that's the, the touchstone. But um, I would say sort of Agatha Christie style uh, puzzle mysteries, um, which are different than what Conan Doyle did. Are, are also very much an influence um, and uh, her sort of approach to a mystery. And certainly, um, I, I never read a ton of Christie when I was young, but I read a little, and I was very fond of the uh, Peter Ustinov uh, Poirot movies. Sure. And that was sort of stuck in my head uh, as one model of what a detective would be. But when I set out to create my guys, partially as an outgrowth of that premise that I was talking about, that it was going to be the West and they were going to be cowboys, but also just an outgrowth of who I am and where I come from and, and what I find appealing uh, in, in uh, heroes was that they were absolutely going to be uh, working class. They were going to be uh, people who are coming up from, um, you know, if not 
poverty than something very much like it. And they are going to be sort of representing, you could call it an American uh, ideal, an American democratic ideal um, that, I, that I think the, uh, the, the Sherlock Holmes model uh, gives access to of um, you don't have to be a gentleman in your, uh, in your sitting room, in your uh, smoking jacket to be solving these mysteries um, or you don't have to be a, uh, you know, a Belgian gentleman with a wax mustache to be, to have the brain power to do this. Anyone that encounters this stuff and thinks about it can, with the power of their intellect, do the same things that those other people would do. So in, in the first book, it's, there's very much more sort of, um, than in some of the later ones, just because of who the, our heroes are interacting with, who's like sort of nobility who've come over to the West, um, there's, there's sort of a bit of a class struggle going on, and um, that was sort of baked right into uh, Gustav and Otto right from the beginning. And also that cowboys were the lowest of the low. That's something that I, I don't think people in America remember, is like, because uh, cowboys have been so mythologized. But it was dirty, dangerous grunt work that uh, if you did it, you were pretty much guaranteed to be... Um, semi-literate if you were lucky and uh, very poorly paid and um you know maybe not the greatest thinker in the world unless you were uh and uh <laughs> this was just a stepping stone to something else um so um so with alanis um the for her her tragic backstory was not quite so deliberate on my uh uh in terms of uh, me sort of making a point um, I think it was that uh, as I developed her backstory, um, it it led me in that direction. Originally, um, she was going to be uh, much more of a classic, uh, cozy protagonist, uh, which, and this is going to sound maybe a little snarky, and I don't really mean it to be, but sometimes classic, cozy protagonists are that can sort of be code for a middle class white woman of a certain age who's a little bit on the white bread side, um, a little boring maybe even, a uh, little middle of the road. And w me being me, I wanted to push back against that. I, I didn't want, I love boring middle class people being one myself. Um, but for the protagonist of this series, I, um, I wanted to throw something in the mix that didn't, that wasn't so standard, um, that wasn't another sort of that kind of protagonist um, takes over a shop and then um, meets a hunky cop and uh, then solves a murder, you know, sort of ABC. Uh, I wanted to mix it up and throw some twists into that story. So the twist that I gave her was that her uh, she was raised by a con artist uh, and she was raised by uh, someone who would have taught her that uh, the tarot was just a tool for manipulating people. Um, and that also gave me the opportunity to explore that side of the tarot because, and I guess I should say a little bit about the origin of the series, that it wasn't my idea. It was the, the, the series, um, the, the nugget that it grew from, or the, the seedling, was uh, my friend Lisa Falco, um, who is a fantastic tarot reader and had an idea to write a book about a tarot reader who uses her gifts with the cards to help her clients. And it would be, I guess, sort of a drama um, where her, it would just be sort of her interacting with these people and sort of helping them through their trials and tribulations. And when she told me this idea, I said, that's a fantastic idea, but somebody's got to die and she's got to solve the mystery uh, with the cards bing, bang, boom, it's a mystery series. And uh, Lisa thought that was a good idea. And then a few years passed, and uh, I had an opportunity to um, pitch book ideas to some people. And so I went to, and Lisa hadn't written that book yet. So I said, Lisa, hey, should we just do this together? And she was like, yeah, let's do it. So that's how we teamed up to do it. But Lisa is, as I said, a fantastic tarot reader, a believer in the the, the sort of power of the cards, I am, even though I've, I'm very impressed with her abilities with the tarot deck, um, and I'm a very open-minded fellow, I'm also a more um, cynical guy, 
And I'd had some encounters with tarot card readers over the years, and those people were scam artists, just flat out, um, which isn't to say that uh, there aren't more people like Lisa out there, but there's also that other side to it. So this, this was in the mix of my head um, of what was going on in my, in my brain as I was thinking about the series, too, is I wanted a way to write about tarot cards where all of Lisa's expertise could be drawn in, and yet we would acknowledge that darker uh, con artist side to it, which is very real. And, well, isn't it a nice way to balance those two things, to have someone start on one side but transition to the other? So that at the beginning of the series, Alanis completely assumes that the tarot, yeah, it's just this, this tool for, for hitting a markup for some easy money. But then as she's forced to pretend to be a tarot reader, the more she's forced to pretend, the more she learns it. And the more she learns it, the more she realizes that she's actually good at it. And the more she realizes she's good at it, the more she realizes there's something to it. So there you go. That's uh, Alanis's um, history. And, and that sort of, again, is why she ended up having uh, a more tragic uh, backstory in terms of her this relationship with her, her mother that went so bad, is that her mother was a bad person and used the tarot, we'd learn, you know, eventually for not good ends. And Alanis has to figure out and prove to herself that she's not that kind of person. She's a hero. Sure. Um, one of the things I liked about that, that series was the underlying um, skepticism that Biddle's voice introduces into it. And she's almost internalized Biddle's voice growing up. So that, that was always very, I really enjoyed the input from Biddle, even when he wasn't actually there, but from Biddle in her head and what his advice about how to grow up and how to treat life it was it was great i actually um feel a little guilty about i did introduce you you at the beginning as talking about cozy mysteries but i don't actually myself see either of these series as being particularly cozy it's just that that seems to have been the niche that they've been put into in some of the um things that reviews and things that you read on the web but they don't fit for me quite the um the pattern of the normal cozy mystery, if that's if that's any consolation. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing, and I think that's been um, that's been part of my challenge uh, as somebody sort of who has to, uh, you know, all writers sadly have to think about the marketing and branding aspect of it. And I think that's always been a challenge for me. Is yeah, from the beginning, the Homes in the Range series uh, were sometimes categorized as cozies, um, and I don't have anything against cozies. But it's a sort of funny mix, and I think maybe they got put in the cozy camp merely because in mainstream crime fiction today, um, puzzle mysteries of the old school kind, which I really love, has has been de-emphasized so much. And so he, I came along, and I because I was sort of a throwback where no, the clues really matter a lot, and there's a there's a ton of red herrings, and you can actually keep track of all this and piece it all together, which I know you would say, oh, yeah, all mysteries are like that, but uh, yes and no. Um, I think if you look at the way mysteries were written in the classic, you know, Christie era, and the way the typical mystery is today, they're not really constructed quite in the same way, and so I think mine were a little bit of a throwback, and because of that, even a book that some people might want to call a Western um, or some people would just call it a historical mystery. Some people just wanted to call it a cozy because it's as well, it kind of reminds them of Agatha Christie and doesn't that what cozies grew out of? Um, and then with the tarot mysteries, uh, I think the argument could made it, be made and it maybe it would be a very good one that that should have been a much more uh, category cozy series that, um, and that was the thing that when I first heard Lisa talk about it, I was like, oh yeah, you or someone else should write that because that's exactly like a lot of cozies that are out there in the market. And then me being me, when I finally came around to write it, I just couldn't color within the lines. You know, I just couldn't make it stick to um, the the formula. And I because that's oh darn it, that's just me. So because of that, um, yeah, I think they, they're sort of these quasi cozies where it's it's hitting a lot of the same notes that a cozy might but also coming at it from a much more um 
sort of cynical, um, skeptical, slightly darker uh, perspective. Um, and because of that, I think it might have made it a little harder to, to, to market and find an audience. Um, but uh, what the heck, I love them. Sure. And that sort of slides a little bit into the, the, the topic of genre generally. And um, I think we're both aware that the thriller genre is one of the most popular um, categories for reading, particularly in the in the ebook market. Have you got any thoughts about why thrillers might particularly appeal to our our time? Oh yeah, I think um, because thrillers are pure story, and this this gets for me a little bit to why I actually really prefer mysteries. Um, thriller, it's all about a propulsive plot. And it's it's page turner stuff, right? And and you would say like, well, all genre fiction is is page turner material. We're supposed to be always trying to draw people through the story, absolutely. But I f- I feel like in the mystery genre, there is more leeway for stuff that I really enjoy a ton, which is to take your time a little bit more and get to know the characters very well, and to sort of sink into the setting with them. And to sort of move through their world, I won't say at a leisurely pace, because I don't want to give anyone the mistaken impression that my books are boring, <laughs> but that um, it's not that you have to have an explosion at the end of every chapter. I mean, hopefully you do have a development. You have something um, every step of the way that keeps you wanting to take that next step. Uh, so you're always drawing the reader through, but it doesn't have to be... Um, by raising the stakes to some um, ridiculous level or, um, you know, having somebody run in with a gun. Although, hey, sometimes, you know, in a mystery, it is handy to have somebody run in with a gun. Um, But yes, thrillers are go, go, go. Um, And because they're, you know, we live in fast-paced times, right? And everybody's attention is divided among a million different things. Um, And I think that that just makes them um, very hooky. Uh, And that hook... Uh, is uh, is very appealing to readers, and I totally understand that. It's just as I'm not exactly that kind of reader myself, so uh, I totally get it. But I just I've thought sometimes about boy, should I try to write something that's more thrillery? Because you know the way certain writers, certain mystery writers break out is they'll they'll establish establish themselves with a series, you know, yeah. show that they're they're bona fides, and then you write, of course your standalone thriller. And that's the thing that opens the door for you to be marketed in a different way by the publishing company and to reach a bigger audience that's, that really voraciously consumes those sort of James Patterson uh, things. And I just, I don't know, I just don't think that's, I don't think I'll ever try it. Because, you know, I do feel like... Um, it's an adage you'll hear thrown around a lot, and I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of exceptions to the rule, but for me, I think it would hold absolutely true is don't try to write a book that you wouldn't want to read. So I'm not really a fan of thrillers. I shouldn't write a thriller. I really enjoy mysteries. I guess I'll keep writing mysteries. Yeah, and that's interesting because I do agree with you about the, the one of the things I enjoy about mysteries is having that chance to just enjoy a setting a little bit more, whether it's a historic setting or whether it's even contemporary. And and I know a lot of people feel the same way, that after they've read a book which really gives you a good feeling of the setting, that there's that feeling that you'd quite like to go and visit that place. And, and if you were going to organise a literary magical mystery tour for your book, um, where would you trip advise people to go? Now, I'm thinking about particularly, I guess, the White Magic Five and, five and Dime because your I think it is it is a fictional town in that story, isn't it? But it's set very close mm-hmm. to Sedona. Yeah, it's basically my take on Sedona. It's it's me doing Sedona. Uh, but a little more run down because that's the way I always want to push things is to make them a little more pathetic. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and being able to kill people and have the police be incompetent without people in Sedona actually getting mad at me. So <laughs> it's giving me some nice cover. So I just call it Burdash. Um, and uh, Burdash was a, was a fun word to, to throw at the town. I, I don't remember how I originally stumbled across it in my research, but 
Um, and I don't remember um, which language it, it is, but it comes from a Native American language. Um, and it's referring to a concept in, in one of the, 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 uh, the Indian nations of, um, of another gender, of a, of a person who actually combines the qualities of both genders. Um, and um, I thought it was really fun to make that the town because wasn't it going to be a mixture of me and Lisa? Um, and, uh, I, you know, if I end up doing those, those books at the moment, there's only the three. Um, I'm, you know, and there's, there's going to be a little bit of a hiatus for the series. I was really looking forward to exploring Burdash a lot more, um, because when you've got a place that's sort of like Sedona, which, uh, if people don't know, it's, it's a town in the West here that's sort of famous for its, um, its vibes and its supposed sort of new age properties and, uh, the sort of mystical stuff that, that supposedly goes on in the desert, which is why you have a lot of people making money off of tours of these mystical places. Um, so it's, it's sort of bringing in the mystical side, but very much that commerce more cynical side. So again, that made it the perfect, uh, blend for this series, which is doing those things too. Um, so yeah, Burdash would be a great, I'd love to go to Burdash. I've certainly thought a lot and I've got a lot of notes about what's where in that town. Um, so I feel like if you plopped me down on main street, I'd do a pretty good job of uh, finding the best restaurant, uh, to eat in and the best place to stay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So just moving on to your own tastes in reading, you've mentioned that you wouldn't want to write a book that you didn't feel like reading. When you were younger, were you a big reader? And, and have you ever been a binge reader of, of, at any stage of your life? Yeah, I was, I was always a reader. Uh, I remember the first binge read I did uh, and this is probably going back to, oh my gosh, I don't know, fourth grade or something, was uh, the Paddington Bear books that the, my school library had. It was What is his name? Bond, I think was the guy's name. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, who just passed away not that long ago. He must have been, um, he must have lived a nice long life because this would have been like in the, oh my gosh, the late 70s or something that I discovered these books and they looked kind of old even then. But uh, there was like five or six Paddington at large, like those kinds of things. Um, and I remember um, reading those over and over and over again. Um, and uh, I was also a big fan, especially as I got a little older from there, of um, sort of You Are There uh, history books. Uh, there was actually a series called You Are There, if I'm remembering right. So it would be like You Are There at the Alamo. Uh, or you are there at the Battle of Gettysburg, that sort of thing. And I, I really loved reading um, biographies of people, like sort of frontier figures like uh, Jim Bowie or Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone, uh, those kinds of guys. And um, and growing out of that was always a big um, a big history buff as a kid, um, and really enjoyed that. My early teens, I was a very I was a big uh, science fiction reader because I had been a big uh, Star Trek fan. Yeah, and I've. If there's one thing that I did read, you know, binge read voraciously, um, I guess I shouldn't be embarrassed about this. There's nothing wrong with it. It was Star Trek novels. I loved Star Trek novels, and I can remember pestering the people at the local bookstore. Uh, is there a new Star Trek novel out? And I just couldn't wait uh, to get back into the like the latest adventure. Um, and I would stay up, you know, till three, four, five in the morning, you know, uh, to finish the the newest one that I was able to get my hands on. And that led me into more science fiction stuff. Um, and it's funny, uh, that I read all of that, uh, you know, pretty voraciously through my teens because I don't read any science fiction now and I don't have anything against the genre. Uh, I'm still fond of it, but I have no desire to read it anymore. Um, I'd, I'd much rather read, um, historical things. So I, uh, at, at this stage I'm, um, uh, I'm really a fan of historical mysteries and westerns. Um, I've really gotten into westerns in the last few years. And it's funny because when I started writing the Holmes and the Range novels, which are arguably pseudo-westerns, I, I liked westerns. I liked western movies. I didn't really know much about um, the, the literary genre. Uh, I, I guess I was probably a little bit wary of it. Um, and now I've, I've really gotten into it and, and really love it um, and wish that I had many, many more hours in the day to be, to be reading books. 
So is there any particular series that you'd like to mention that, that uh, our listeners might want to pick up on? Is there anyone you're binge reading at the moment that um, comes to mind? Well, you know, in the mystery field, I would throw out a classic that um, is is near and dear to my heart. And I think is, um, even though I didn't come to it until after I'd started writing mysteries, it just seemed like, oh yeah, this is this this is this and me we are simpatico um it's the um nero wolf mysteries by rex stout and they're very good for binge readers because there's a lot of them uh rex stout i probably wrote like 30 novels or something 30 uh, nero wolf novels uh i'm sure maybe almost 40 Uh, there's a lot um and the thing that's really fun about um those nero wolf books uh and the reason that i really identify with them uh, in terms of my own approach to the mystery genre, is that if you if you break down how the plots work um, and how the mysteries are resolved, they are very much growing out of the Agatha Christie tradition, sort of what one could call an English uh, mystery tradition. But the voice of it is a very American voice. It's a sort of pseudo although it's not trying too hard, and a lot of people do when they do this, sort of a pseudo-Raymond Chandler voice, sort of a, a funny, streetwise, um, cynical uh, voice. And so you're melding the, um, the worldview and protagonist of an American-style mystery, if you're talking about American-style circa you know, 1941, with uh, the emphasis uh, on the sort of the, the fun intellectual puzzle of an Agatha Christie style mystery, an English style mystery, circa you know nineteen forty one, you're going to get uh, Rex Stout and Nero Wolf, um, and it's sort of for me like that's the best of both worlds, and I hope that in particular the Holmes and the Range books do that too. Just looking at your overall career, if there was one thing that you'd want to do differently, what would it be, or is there nothing really that you'd want to change? Well, I guess that's an excellent question, and it's one that I uh, that I ask myself from time to time. If I could change uh, one thing, I guess it would be uh, that I would like to be spectacularly successful, um, which is pro- <laughs> probably <laughs> what uh, what many people in my position would say. Um, that uh, you know how the mechanism by what by by which one would achieve that? Oh gosh, I don't know. So I, you know, um, you could try many, many different things. I, I would have to experiment with many things, going retroactively, tra- time traveling in my past and whispering in my ear to tell me to do something different before you could figure out what really would make a difference. Because um, you know how it is. Publishing is a is a crazy field, and nobody ever really knows why something is successful. I mean, you can kind of try to reverse engineer it once something is successful, but you never know going forward what's going to be successful and what's not. Um, so um, I'm very proud of uh, the novels that I wrote, and um, I feel like uh, I want to do more. I want to just keep doing more. Um, so so that's what I'm going to set my mind to. And... Um, you know, spectacularly successful, well, um, I'll, I'll be very pleased with having readers, uh, which I have, and fans, which I have, um, and uh, that's a beautiful thing. Sure, sure, sure. Well, look, it's been great talking to you, Steve. It really has. We've certainly seen your garrulous side today, and that's been, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Um, people can find you at... SteveHawkinsmith.com, can't they? They sure can, and I'm on uh, Twitter every so often, once in a blue moon. I'm not a big Twitter guy, but I'm on Facebook, So, uh, and I'm on Facebook uh, pretty frequently just talking about stuff, uh, you know, not even just trying to sell stuff, but just, you know, talking about uh, movies and books and uh, what crazy thing my dogs did today. So I definitely encourage people to, to look me up on Facebook and send me a friend request. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for any episode at the website, thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments, suggestions you have for who you'd like us to interview next, 
And if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to subscribe on iTunes or similar provider. That way, you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us today and happy reading.